Kevin Andrews, thanks for joining Lessons in Leadership. Pleasure to be with you, Peter. Let's go back to the start. How did you find out that you were going to be Defence Minister? It was quite unexpected. I'd been Minister for Social Services for, I think, about 15 months, and there was some talk about some leadership changes, but I thought that might affect me at all. So I went for a bike ride on a Sunday morning and turned my phone off, only to get home two or three hours later to get urgent calls from the Prime Minister wanting to talk to me. So I phoned Tony and uh, he said, I'd like you to be the Minister for Defence. And I was taken aback by that, not because I've got anything against defence, but because I was partly into a reform process in social services. And I actually said to him, I'm sure you can find somebody else to do the job, Tony. Anyway, we had a conversation for about 10 minutes in which I put reasons why I should stay in social security and finish the welfare reform. But at the end of the day, I said, look, I'm a team player. So yes, I accept the, the invitation. So it happened um, unexpectedly. When uh, uh, Tony came to you with the offer, uh, Defence has got a pretty fearsome reputation for chewing through ministers. Was that, was that a concern for you? Or? No, it was, wasn't anything to do with Defence. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I hadn't had a background in my political career that really related to defence. Um, immigration, I suppose, was the closest that I got to it. It was more that, uh, you know, my, my long-term interest in public policy had been about welfare, families, social security, those sort of matters, and I'd finally been appointed the minister to do that, and I wanted to do serious welfare reform, and I'd yeah. started that. We'd done the McClure report and things like that. So I thought, look, you know, it's silly to remove me from this area when I'm just in the process of getting things done. Right. Mm. Uh, so, so your predecessor was uh, David Johnson. And yes. He'd, he'd had a pretty stormy departure from the portfolio. Did, did he hand over? Did he give you any advice? How, how did that work? Look, not really. Um, no, no. I, and that's no reflection on David. I, you know, my experience has been that generally there's no great handover process. It may be the nature of politics and what happens when reshuffles occur. Mm. People can feel disappointed and hurt. Um, so, no, there wasn't any, any great handover. And, and actually, that's been the pattern with the ministers we've, we've spoken to. It's, it's sort of straight into the deep end. Mm. Uh, and so what was your um, early thoughts about engaging with the department? I mean, how do you actually begin the process of establishing yourself yes. in a job like that? Well, to come back to your previous observation, I mean, there were always stories around that defence was the graveyard for ministers. And um, I'd been in previous graveyards before, including ageing and um, workplace relations. So I thought, uh, you know, there is a way to work through this. You shouldn't accept what sort of the, the general views around town mm. about particular portfolios. My approach to, to every ministry I've had is to essentially put your head down for the first two months, learn everything you can, read everything you can, get as briefed as much as you can, make as few public statements uh, that you can get away with, with making, uh, and really try and get on top of the portfolio, at least at a broad, superficial or a bit more than superficial level. Uh, and that's the way I approach defence. Uh, and and I, I guess the, the ritual is pretty early on in the process, the Secretary and CDF come across to introduce themselves and, yes. and now you have to build a relationship with two people that, particularly in the case of the CDF, uh, is the sort of the masters of their professional domain. What was your experience of that? Um, how do you start to build that type of trusting relationship? Uh, just by being absolutely genuine. Um, I think there's some secrets to being a successful minister. One is to be yourself and don't pretend to be anything else. Don't pretend to be an expert in the area when you're dealing with people who are experts in the area mm. in terms of the detail. Understand that your job is much more at a strategic and political level. Uh, but also um, it was my um, aspiration from the outset that whatever discussions and uh, differences we might have privately sitting around the table in briefings, there would not be a cigarette paper between us in public. Mm -hmm. That is that when we went out, uh, what I said, what the CDF said, what the Secretary of the Department said was all the same thing. Yes. Now, uh, uh, Kevin, pretty early on in your, in your term, you actually went with Tony Abbott to the Middle East. Mm. Uh, I think it was within easily a month of, of I think it was about 10 days, actually. Yeah, yes. yeah. Mm. 
Um, and of course, that's one of the unique aspects of the portfolio is that you are dealing with people that government has sent into harm's way. What were your sort of reactions to what you saw on that and subsequent visits? And, and how did you think of your role as minister when it came to the operations of yes. the Defence Force? Well, obviously, the, the actual operations are directed and commanded by the CDF and those under him. But the Minister's also got an important role um, through the National Security Committee of Cabinet because in, in the end it's, it's that committee and the Minister who authorise um, operations such as in Iraq. So to go there was very important, to be able to be on the ground, to be, you know, have some experience of what was happening in that country, you know, to fly from the airport to the green zone in helicopters, you know, surrounded by uh, special forces, just gave you a sense that, mm. you know, this is a dangerous place. Mm. Um, so that was important. To be able to talk to our troops on the ground was very important and try to understand something of the experiences they were having and to get feedback from them. So coming at a very early stage in, in the ministry, uh, I think that was very significant in terms of my better appreciation of what the, what the Defence Forces are actually experiencing. Now, uh, in, in your time, the, the big story was about the um, uh, air operations against the so-called Islamic State, uh, heavily in Western Iraq, and then uh, gradually the government sort of extended the Air Force uh, activities over into Syria itself. Um, can you sort of explain f for the audience how a, a minister interacts in that, in that approach? What's the sort of daily discussions with the department? How was the NSC playing into this uh, issue? Um, the NSC was, um, well, gave authority in the, in the first place. So there were discussions at NSC involving the, the CDF, the, the secretary, um, and the members of the, of the NSC about what we should do, what was possible, um, what Australia's role was in these circumstances. Thereafter, um, I as minister would report to the the National Security Committee every time it met about this and any updates on what was happening, as did the CDF, in terms of the operational matters. Uh, but then it became an issue essentially on a day-to-day -day conversation between the CDF and myself as to what was happening. And I would get mm. daily reports as to what the operations were, uh, you know, what planes we had in the air, what strikes had been made. Uh, hopefully not hearing that there have been casualties involving Australians, which is always the biggest fear or regret of a defence minister. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's how it essentially operated. Uh, and whilst the uh, air campaign was happening, we also had uh, our forces uh, providing mentoring to um, Iraqi special forces, which at, at the end of the day became really the, the, the pointy end of the attack on Mosul, which was mm. the, the, the last major town that IS held out. Um, and at the time, uh, Kevin, there was a debate around uh, how far should our forces go yes. in the support of those Iraqi forces. We were advising and, and assisting, but we weren't accompanying those forces when they went into, into the battlefield. Were, were you comfortable with that sort of policy lay down? I was, because this was difficult in terms of the, the dynamics of it, both in Australia and around the world. And um, the advise and assist role seemed to me to be quite appropriate. Um, we were dealing with um, a very mixed group in terms of the Iraqi forces, in terms of their experience, mm. uh, in terms of their professionalism compared to what we would expect in, in Australia. And so that was a very difficult role for uh, the Australian forces who were there, and I think they carried it out in an exemplary uh, manner. Should they have gone further in terms of, you know, a combat role, I suppose that question never arose on my watch. Uh, the, advise, the advise and assist seemed to be sufficient for what was required at the time. Now, you had um, in Tony Abbott a Prime Minister that was pretty forward-leaning when it came to thinking about the Defence Force. Did that result in any difficult conversations between him and you? What was your relationship with uh, Tony? And Tony and I Lyon? were pretty much on the same page. Yeah, uh, There wasn't, I mean, you know, there might have been issues from time to time in which we uh, disagreed about the detail, uh, but in terms of the strategic approach, uh, I think we shared fairly much a common position. Did you have any doubts or misgivings about the, the broader strategy that we were employing in the, in the Middle East? Uh, not at that stage, no. Um, 
uh, I think we're well and truly committed to that strategy. And once you've committed to a strategy um, such as that, then you've got to follow through with it, basically. Yeah. And it wasn't a question of um, withdrawing. There was no question that we should be easing off, if anything. Um, I think at the back of our minds was, should we be doing more? Mm -hmm. So let's switch the conversation now to really the other, uh, well, one of the other major aspects of being Defence Minister, and that was the um, defence capability story, because mm. at precisely the same time as this, uh, uh, the operations were unfolding in the Middle East, the government had some pretty big decisions on its plate with regard to equipment acquisition. And, and I want to talk about some of the, the, the specifics of that. But again, um, let, let's start with, with a sort of general sense of, um, uh, so all of a sudden on your desk starts to arrive incredibly thick, complex submissions about defence capability. How, mm. how did you sort of react and deal with that? Uh, again, to try and get on top of much of it, to, to, to understand it at a broad strategic level and not get bogged down in the detail. I didn't need to know how a destroyer worked in, in fine detail or um, the ins and outs of a submarine, but I did need to know what's the strategic importance, what's the time frame we need to be putting in place. And I suppose I had an advantage in this sense that there'd been considerable delays for a long period of time in some of the replacement uh, of our, our uh, defence equipment, our, our naval fleet in particular. Uh, and so it was, I suppose, easy enough to um, come to a decision that we've got to get on with this job. As I said, I had a Prime Minister who was very supportive of doing this and overall a National Security um, Committee that was supportive of this and indeed the senior leadership of the, the ADF, both mm -hmm. at the, the military and the, the civilian side of it. So there wasn't really a great deal of disagreement, uh, as I recall, about just needing to get on with it. We'd promised that we would return uh, defence expenditure to uh, above 2%, as I recall the actual wording. Some people say these days 2%. I think we said a minimum of 2%. Mm. Um, so that all fitted in the context because defence expenditure was, was low. And we also, as you know from the white paper process, were looking at a 20-year a plan of which we were spelling out what the first 10 years of acquisitions would be. Yes. So this was forward-looking, which it had to be, and you know, regretfully for a whole range of reasons this hadn't occurred for a decade or so before. Mm. So February 2015, you're now three months into the job, um, uh, the government announces uh, the approach it's going to take to the, the, the design selection of the future submarine. Pretty complex piece of choreography mm. here. What, what's your memory of that? And, um, you know, were, were you comfortable with the proposal or yes. the process that was put forward? Well, the, the competitive evaluation um, process was deliberately designed to address both the technical issues, um, the financial question, and the political issue that we were dealing with domestically here in mm. Australia. Um, as you recall, the, committee, the competitive evaluation process was to seek, um, uh, in effect, quotations from the submitters, um, the, the Germans, the French, and the Japanese, which involved alternatives of a full offshore build, uh, a full onshore build, or a hybrid build. Mm -hmm. Now, that was done quite deliberately for two reasons. One is to be able to um, compare the cost of an onshore build, a hybrid build, and an offshore build, knowing that the offshore build would clearly be the cheapest because it was being built where submarines had been built before. And it was also to try and deal with the domestic political problem, and that is that there was this clamour for, uh, for the submarines to be entirely built in Australia. Now, I wasn't there at the end of this process, but that was the reason it was put in place. Yes. Um, it, it was an interesting journey to get to that point because it, it, it had started with Tony Abbott being very much enamoured of the, of the Japanese Soru-class mm. submarine. Uh, and it looked for a while like the government was just going to go down that track. I mean, what, what's your memory of how that particular issue played out? I think the support for the Japanese submarine was more than just the submarine itself. It was about how we build a strategic relationship in our area, mm. uh, in the, in the Indo-Pacific, with a major power, namely Japan, that had been very friendly to us. Um, and you know we, we were very keen to build relationships with Japan, with Singapore, with India, 
uh, with like-minded nations um, in the region. So the Japanese proposal was in the broader context of our strategic environment and our strategic interests. But yeah. it was also clear that there had to be some sort of competitive process in order to get the best submarines. So we, uh, we ended up with the three, the, the Germans, the French and the Japanese. Uh, and you know, out of that, we hoped that the, the competitive evaluation process would actually throw up the best tender, yeah. but it also give the government the ability to judge what the real value was in terms of the build. And my view always was that it should be a hybrid build. Um, we know from other shipbuilding that the most expensive costs come with the first two or three vessels that are being built. We knew from a RAND study of um, surface ships that it can cost up to 45% more to build a ship uh, onshore in Australia compared mm. to offshore. Mm. And my view was with a submarine that differential would be even greater. Yes. Uh, so one of the, the mysteries of the process was that the, the Swedes were left out of the uh, invitation to be part of the competitive evaluation mm. process. And, and of course, Sweden had been the, the principal designer of the Collins class submarine. Was this something that was sort of discussed at, at any length at all by, by government or defence in terms of deciding not to include them in the it, process? It, it was discussed, and whilst I can't go into the detail, Peter, um, the clear advice to me was that the Swedish proposal, the Swedish submarine simply wasn't up to what we required for Australia, whereas the other three, uh, with modification obviously, um, could possibly meet our requirements. Yes. So as you said, the, uh, the, the final decision happened after your time as Minister. When, when you heard that the French had been selected, were you surprised? I wasn't surprised. Um, um, I visited all three um, shipyards uh, during the time as Defence Minister and had a bit of an insight into at least how they, they were constructing their vessels and, and their operations. Each of the bids had their strengths and weaknesses. The, the Germans, in my view, were the best marketers mm. of the whole three. Mm. They were very good at that. They employed um, John White here in Australia at the head of their operations and it was a very slick operation. Uh, the French were quite good at marketing um, as well. The Japanese were the worst at marketing because they'd never sold a piece of military hardware, let alone the most important piece of military hardware at all. And even the fact that they allowed me to go on to a submarine that they were constructing at uh, Kobe it was remarkable. I met with uh, Prime Minister Abe the next day and he told me that I'd done something that he, even he hadn't done. Oh. And I said, what was that? And he said, you've actually been on a, on a Japanese submarine in wow. construction. Yeah. So this was all very new um, and difficult for the Japanese. Mm. Uh, the challenges were that the German submarines were basically being built for um, the North Sea, the Baltic, that area. Uh, the French submarine was much larger than what we required and also nuclear powered, so it had to be retro-engineered mm. to put a, a diesel electric engine in it. And the, uh, the Japanese submarine, uh, whilst it met our requirements in terms of the power source, it needed to be bigger. We, what we needed was bigger than what the Japanese were building mm. uh, and more developed. So none of them were actually ideal that you could just take off the shelf and apply to Australia. Uh, and so there were challenges in relation to all of them. Um, as to surprise, no, look, I, uh, I privately would have been surprised if one of the other bids had won, but I won't say which one right. that was. I thought it was a, I thought in the end, it was a race in two of which the French were one. Right, right, that's fascinating. Uh, the other big project that um, uh, w was causing the government some headache at the time was the air warfare destroyer. I, I think we were pretty much on to the second ship at the time you were minister. I think the third by the time I was minister. Okay, was so cool, yes. I, I toured the second ship. I yes. mean, the first was a really hard process of getting, frankly, the blueprints to work. Yes. Number two was better, number three yes. was best of all. What, what's the experience like of being Minister when you're there to try to remediate a project that's got a bit of a bad reputation? Uh, well, first of all, you've just got to try and push it along as, as, as quickly as you can. Um, secondly, you can't get panicked as a Minister because mm. there are all sorts of reports about it being over time and over budget, which were, were true. Um, it reflected to me a couple of things. One is that always in the first vessel or two of a project it's going to cost more than expected and you know hopefully over time the cost comes down and that's generally been the trend uh, and thirdly we we were employing a different approach to building the air, for, air, air warfare destroyer to what had been in Europe you know Europe you had hundreds of years of 
naval engineers um, who didn't have plans the way in which we drew them up that just understood things, whereas our people didn't because they didn't have that background or, or generations of experience. So you were trying to mould two engineering cultures together, mm. uh, and which, which comes back to my earlier point about why you know, my belief was very strongly that any, any naval vessel that we, you know, any substantial naval vessel, I'm not talking about a, you know, a small vessel, that we build in Australia that, that involves uh, an overseas constructor, it's probably best if you have a hybrid approach to it. Yes, yes. So let me um, <clears throat> turn to a, a different area now, which was internal defence organisation. And yes. uh, it does seem to be the curse of every defence minister that you're presented with the requirement for uh, like an internal review of higher defence management. Yes. Uh, it, yours was the first principles review. Yes. What was your thinking about that? When, when this sort of started to come up to your office, did you think there were deficiencies inside defence management that needed to be addressed? I didn't think that there was the degree of coordination which we'd expected. I, I just thought coming into it, and we're talking about the Australian Defence Force, there is a high degree of coordination. And although that had occurred to some extent, I think there was that last piece to be put in the puzzle. So I spent a lot of time with David Peaver, who was um, heading up that uh, review, uh, and I used him to brief me extensively on what was happening. Uh, I think it was largely supported by Dennis Richardson as the Secretary and by Mark Binskin, the, the CDF at the time. So I think we're all on the one page at that level about it. My fear was always that it would be in the mid-level of, of the defence, whether on the civilian management side or, the, or, the, or the, the military side, where you would get the most pushback, which is why once we got the first principles review and the one defence paper out there, uh, I reappointed the committee, uh, the, the PEVA group, to actually continue to monitor mm -hmm. how this would be implemented. And that was something which I did as Defence Minister, not just in that area, but also coming back to shipbuilding in the submarines. So I appointed Don Winter, the mm -hmm. former uh, US Navy Secretary, essentially as a personal advisor to me, um, so that, that things which I didn't understand, I would have a counterpoint of advice from uh, someone who was knowledgeable about this, who could talk uh, and understand things which defence would understand the detail of, but if there was things I'd been told by defence which he thought were a load of nonsense, well, then I'd get this counter, counter view and I was able to balance that off. Mm. And I think that <coughs> what I might call sort of triangulation is important for ministers generally, but I think it's extremely important for a defence minister. So we've certainly heard um, a number of your uh, predecessors in the portfolio t t talk about the struggle that was inherent in dealing with the department and feeling like you were getting accurate advice, which was not always the first piece of advice that might land on your desk. Did, did you find that? Was defence particularly hard compared to other portfolios? Uh, no, it was uh, actually, if I look back over my portfolios, defence was one of the best portfolios right. I had in that regard. Mm. And, and I think that's because of the relationship which I believe I built, but you'd have to ask them, uh, with, with Dennis and with Mark, I, I think we had a very good you know, working relationship. We were, as I said, on the same page publicly, whatever discussions we might have had privately and getting to that point. And I think that, that was very important. I respected them in their role. Um, and I thought we had to work together if this was, if this was going to work. So yes. I, I felt that worked well. I, I think the, the, thing of, the, the thing that any minister has to know is what they don't know. Uh, in, in other words, there are lots of things you don't know. So the questions I would ask would be not the detailed questions about things I thought I knew, but what, what about the things I don't know? So I'd ask, well, if I were you, uh, what, you, what, would you what would I ask that I haven't asked? Or um, if I was in your position, what do you think you know, I should be told that I haven't been told? Yes. So it's those open-ended kind of questions to elucidate what are the other things that I need to know. And then that willingness to get some other advice, not, not to say that defence was wrong, but you know, every, every department has got its view of the world. Um, it's got its own you know, strategic direction it wants to go in, and that's all fair enough. But the minister has to kind of manage that and find out what it is and work out whether or not this is something which is actually going to serve the long-term interest. So it was a combination of um, 
countervailing advice, or at least checking the advice I got from defence, and therefore being able to say to defence, well, what about X, Y, and Z? Mm. Um, that's important, but then working as well as you can together. So, Kevin, I want to talk about managing workload. Uh, defence is, uh, I think, infamous for the volume of paperwork it puts on ministers' desks. How did you manage the experience of dealing with the workload? Look, the workload wasn't um, necessarily greater than other portfolios. Um, my biggest workload was when I came in immigration because there was a huge backlog of ministerial decisions that hadn't been made, and I, you know, worked, you know, not quite twenty four seven, but I was working seven days a week for three or four months just to clear that backlog when right. I came in. So I was used to, you know, having to do a lot of paperwork. Yes. I think a lot of the paperwork that gets sent up to the Defence Minister doesn't need to be there. You know, being brief because a fuel tanker was being moved from Alice Springs to Darwin, I think is a totally unnecessary knowledge for the Defence Minister to have to sign off on, mm. uh, that surely those sort of things should be done at a much lower level. Um, but I've I always had a view that I clear my desk of the paperwork at the end of the week, apart from anything that I deliberately want to hang on to to think about a bit longer. So my process was at the end of the week, all the paperwork was completed and sent back to the department. Right. And the balance of ministerial roles, um, constituency type issues, I mean, being a Victorian, you were lucky that travel, I guess, was not as difficult as no, it is for no. some members of parliament. But how, how does a, a senior minister sort of manage that difficult balance? There's, there's also your home life as well, yes, which has yes. to have a place. Well, uh, regrettably, the home life suffers the most. When I first became a minister, I, I said to myself, I'm going to spend one day a week in my constituency. I ended up speak, spending half a day a fortnight in my constituency, and that never changed right. in all the ministerial roles I had, and yeah. that's just the reality of it. So uh, before people become ministers, it's pretty wise for them to have spent at least a couple of terms in Parliament building up mm. and supporting their own electorate, otherwise they might find that mm. they're turfed out by, by their constituents. And yes, there is a balance, because if you're seen on TV, you're performing a, a major national role, people in your constituency see you and probably think you're there more often than you are. Now, I was, most weekends I was able to be there, but in mm. terms of a, of a working week, uh, if I got there half a day a week, uh, half a day a fortnight, that was about the best the I could best achieve. Could do, yes. Um, the, the, another um, area of busyness during your time in the portfolio was the Defence White Paper, yes. which was announced and started under David Johnson and then completed a few months after your departure by... Well, it was actually, Marie's well, it was actually completed. I had the final the high, final version of it before I departed. On your desk? I'd you read know. it, I'd made notes on it. I think I might have even sent back comments on the on the final version. Now, that was understandable because this was a white paper that was put together through iteration after iteration after iteration. So if you look at the white paper, virtually starting from chapter one right through to the end, that was a chapter written this month, and right. the next chapter was written the following month, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it wasn't all just finally presented at the mm -hmm. end. And, and the chapters as they were written were actually discussed in the National Security Committee. So by the time we got to the end of the white paper, we'd really been going over it yes. many times, and I think it was a very thorough process. A, a very complicated process. Yes. My, my own memory was about 10 or 11 visits to the National Security Committee. Yes. Was it too complex? I mean, did you feel like you were comfortable with how it progressed over the course of your time? Uh, no, I was very comfortable. I, I was comfortable with, with that uh, process of doing it part by part and looking at issue by issue. Um, I was comfortable with the NSC had numerous occasions to look at it and look at parts of it, and I, and and whilst you know, whatever it is now, five years later, um, the world has changed and things move on. I thought it was a very comprehensive document mm. that met the requirements as we understood them at the time. The the, the backstory to this, of course, was the the rise of China, mm. and um, I've, I've I've often made the point that at the time we were producing the white paper, China was doing its island construction yes. in, in the South China. Sea. So there was no sense in which this was a surprise to defence or the government. Um, we all knew this was the background. What, what are your thoughts about um, the, the challenges of dealing with China during your time as minister? It must have been becoming a larger and larger part of your day. Um, it was, and as you say, the, 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 the construction of these artificial islands in the South China Sea was continuing apace. 
um, this was clearly a threat because they weren't being built as um, you know tourist spots to go and look at the South China Sea. They were being built as military in installations. Yeah. And you know, when President Xi stood on the lawns of the White House in I think it was September 2015 and said we're not militarising these islands, well I knew that was totally wrong. Mm -hmm. We, uh, I knew as Defence Minister from intelligence I'd received that they were militarising those islands. They were building runways, hangars, uh, missile installations, ports that you know their coast guard and naval vessels could dock at um etc cetera, etc cetera. so this was a reality uh, i suppose at the time both we and our major allies including the americans thought that we would be able to somehow contain this that um, you know this would be the limit of uh, china's um, aspirations or ambitions but we've found since then that that's not the case mm. uh, you know well, there, were, there were discussions about conducting um, uh, exercises of, of Australian naval ships sailing through freedom of the navigation. South China, the freedom of navigation exercises, yeah. which I was all in favour of. In fact, I was in favour of just every time we had a naval ship in the area, they should just as a matter of course sail through the South China Sea and mm. so should the Americans and the Brits and anybody else who happened to be there just make it a regular exercise. I remember having that discussion with you actually mm. at the time, but government was more restrained on that issue. It was, and I think the Navy was also more restrained on that yeah. issue, to be honest. Um, but my thought was, this, this is not an issue that's going away. I'm not sure that I thought it would escalate to the degree to which China has become as externally aggressive as it has, but certainly there were all the hallmarks that it was, it was going to become more active in the area. Now, um, a domestic issue that, that became prominent just shortly after your departure from the, the portfolio was the decision to um, uh, not prevent, at least, a, a lease of the Port of Darwin for 99 years to a Chinese company. Mm. And, and over your time, uh, at least internally inside the department, some consideration was being given to the proposal from the Northern Territory government to do that. Did any of this um, come up to you for consideration? Peter, I'd have to go back and review the documents, but I do not recall that ever coming to me. And, um, I mean, again, it's just literally a matter of weeks after your mm -hmm. time, but we, we, what was your sort of personal reaction to uh, that particular I was, story? Um, I was dismayed. Um, I don't know whether it ultimately did go to the, to the NSC, but it was obviously a decision it should have. Um, this is a, you know, a matter of our national strategic... Uh, um, security interest as to you know who leases what ports and who has control of them, particularly as important a port as Darwin because it's essentially the jumping off point to Asia. Mm. And, and whilst it's never going to become, as some people think, the submarine base or something like that, nonetheless it's an important military installation so far as Australia is concerned. Mm. Well, let's talk uh, more about the, the sort of reflections looking back on your time in the portfolio. I, I don't recall particularly that Defence presented you with a really nasty media crisis. There are lots of big issues and consequential decisions that, that had to be taken, but did, did you ever find yourself sort of in the, in the eye of a media storm on difficult stuff that was happening? No, no, not really. And I suppose it comes back to that, what I said at the outset about, you know, the, the view being that somehow Defence is a political graveyard for ministers. Um, I was determined that was not going to become the case because I thought, well, you, if that's the case, you're not doing your job, let alone whatever personal interest I might have had um, in the issue. So, as I said, I was determined from the outset that there would be a very strong working relationship between myself, the Secretary and the CDF, and I think we achieved that. And I think if you have that relationship, then issues that could potentially derail the process or individuals won't happen because you're on the same page all mm. the time. And I've also found from other ministerial appointments that if you have your department and the sector that you're responsible to, for largely on side, then they're less likely to undermine you because you're not doing what they think you should be doing. Um, and I've always thought that's an important role that you know a minister has to make sure that his own constituency or her own constituency is very much on side. What were the most difficult parts of being Defence Minister? Um, I'd have to say the submarines. Uh, and because, um, to be frank, I think Australian domestic politics, and if I can be absolutely frank, South Australian domestic politics, um, perverted this discussion for a long period of time under both Labor and Liberal national governments.
Um, and, and really what that means is it's not simply at the state level, it's at, it's at the federal level where South Australians were kind of pushing really hard to yes. try to locate the core of defence industry in, in their state. You, you felt that yes. presented an unrealistic When I had pressure. a colleague stand up in the coalition party room and say that unless every last bolt was made in South Australia and unless every piece of welding was done in South Australia, I think that illustrated the extent of the problem. Yes. And this had obviously occurred under Labor as well because yes. I think the delays that occurred under the Labor Party in terms of making decisions were partly the consequence of how do you resolve this problem. Yes. Well, that's interesting, of course, because the, the, the laydown of industry across Australia inevitably meant that large parts of the maritime work would go. I think, for example, Victoria gets about a third of the value because that's mm. where a lot of the high-tech electronics yes. And, yes. And happens. Yes. So it was never going to be the case that every dollar would go to no. South Australia. But this was in the context of just South Australia, an economy which was languishing. Um, the, the, um, the end of the the, the um, uh, vehicle manufacturing industry, mm -hmm. uh, the combination of those things where jobs were being lost in South Australia, where the economy you know, wasn't going very well, uh, that obviously meant a lot of pressures. Um, South Australia is a one media town, essentially, so you can get one view, uh, which is um, parochial. You know, that's fair enough, I understand that. But, but those pressures made it much more difficult for governments, not just me when I was Defence mm. Minister, but much more difficult to be able to resolve some of these decisions and, and some of those issues are still playing out yeah, today. Exactly. Uh, conversely, the, the high points, the things you take most pleasure at, at thinking about during your time? Uh, look, getting it done, um, you know, getting, getting the, the decision to effectively re replace our naval fleet. I think the white paper was very important. Um, I think it was the most comprehensive white paper uh, defence white paper that we've produced in Australia and, and it stands as a platform for, for future white papers. Um, the one defence getting that, that, that push through and um, following that through, that, that was all um, significant. I, I mean, I, I felt like in what was a relatively short time as Defence Minister um, that, that we achieved a lot, and did a lot of things, got a, you know, many things completed that had been outstanding for some period of time. As you say, it was a pretty r rapid period um, and then of course politics happened yes. and there was a change of leadership yes. and all of a sudden you found yourself out of the yes. cabinet altogether. How do you deal with those sorts of um, big political swings that, you know, one day you're up, the next day you're down um, and regardless of your policy mm. efforts, it's the politics which kind of dominates? Yes. Well, I'm also always mindful, I think it was Kipling's words that, you know, treat victory and defeat as impostors as they are and just get on with life. So, which I've, I've always tried to do that. Yes. It's not the first time in politics that I've been up or down, mm. um, depending on how people, you know, regard up or down. Uh, I suppose I've always taken a long-term view that I'm here in whatever position I can to serve the people of Australia as best I can. So, you just get on with life. Well, Kevin, you said um, there wasn't much of a handover and it was straight into the deep end. But if you had the opportunity to advise a future defence minister, well, what advice would you give them? Uh, put your head down for the first couple of months and learn as much as you can. Understand broadly the strategic directions of the portfolio and don't get bogged down in all the detail. Um, form as close a working relationship as you can with the Secretary of Defence and the Chief of the Defence Forces. Um, um, be prudent um, and never stop asking questions about what I don't know. Yes, yeah, that's fascinating. Well, Kevin, it's been a great pleasure, conversation. Well, thanks for joining Lessons in Leadership. Yeah, my pleasure.